Okay. All righty. Hmm. All righty now. Okay, well, and so welcome now to the place where we are and the locality where we begin our excursions into what may commonly be called the dream time, the dream time, which is a word for something that encompasses us always. And maybe dream time is maybe too specific or too topical. Maybe a word might be, a better word for dream time might be the world. I know that for a long time we've spent our... Uh, energies looking for a better definition of the word world, <laughs> poets. Well, let us now accept the definition of the word world, the word world, which is that which encompasses us, which is this network of entities and relationships and uh, what, you know, charged yet imperfect moral obligations. This is the world which we will be like looking at. And the dream time is simply a literary convention, at least at the beginning. The dream time is a landscape. The dream time, from a literary standpoint, is mm, a setting, a landscape, an encompassing topography. It could be put this way. Jack Spicer said it to me, from the pages of a text, of course. Jack Spicer said to me, from the pages of a text, we are the coastal people. And then he went on to maybe say, we take whatever is coming. Which means to say, we are a people of universal concerns. And by coastal, we could consider coastal as being like, what? The skirting edge of something? but also like an undulating, curving edge, also like a boundary which follows its own structure as a line. We could speak of this way, speak of it this way, and we could speak of the coast is clear. And um, at one time, it might have been thought that the, to say the coast is clear might mean that you know, the way is open or the way is open in which we can escape, or the way is open where we can get past the guards, whatever guards there might be for whatever inner or outer excursion that we are planning. But we could also say the coast is clear to mean that the coast itself, as a place of arrival, is clear. In other words, our landing craft, if we are in a, a boat at sea, for example, has a place to go. The coast is clear. We can meet the shore in our vessels because there will be no obstacles and we can land freely. It, it's a, so it's a reciprocal kind of thing to say that the coast is clear. And it's a, almost a universal thing to say that we are a coastal people because isn't it true that the human species itself is a, a phenomena of coasts? Couldn't we say that the human species itself is a form in time that inhabits a, a closeness to its own limit and seems to grow and um, proceed along its entelechy or along the, um, the path of its, of its morphology or the path of its development or its demon along like the edge of something, the edge of perception. Could it be that we could say, see it this way? And of course we could. But it also has a specific meaning meaning tonight. We're going to look at, I guess, just a little sample, just a little taste of coastal mythologies and of coastal literatures and of coastal utterances. 
literatures, mythologies, and utterances are what we will consider um, in a way that is primary to their further outgrowths as verse or poetry or prose. So it's always going to like, you know, reflect back on some kind of literary kind of schema, some literary caper that um, will be guiding us. Yeah. And so, as poets, we start, even before we know it, from early on, we start seeking out into the literary forms that are available to us and um, in our land, in our culture, in our generation, in our time, uh, what was available to us in our formative years as poets in the beginning of our entelechy, in the beginning of our you know, destined education. What was available to us were libraries and shelves and stacks of books. And each of the titles, as we learned to read in the schools, as we were taught in the primary grades, as we were taught and offered things which would beckon us to, to, to discover the worlds upon the worlds behind the titles on the spines of the books, you see. And, um, and then we would turn the pages and um, the inscriptions upon the pages would bestow upon us images in our minds. And um, behind every image is a vision. And behind every metaphor is a mythology. And these are the things that draw us on as we seek the sources of our inspiration. Much like uh, an, any animal would follow something in the wild, in the landscape of its own wild place that would lead it towards some source of, of sustenance for itself. And uh, as a species, as a human species, um, manifesting this uh, archetypal identity of poet, um, the, um, the search is on for the sources of our inspiration, which we found in words, which we found in collections of words, which we found in the pages of books, often enough. But even then, as children... Imagine yourself as an ideal reader as a child, and there's a little bit of it in all of us, right? Imagine yourself as an ideal reader as a child, and you go through the sections of the library, and you're reading practically everything, sure, um, that draws your attention, but what you really are looking for is something to be, something to take and learn from so that you can give more clarity and vividness to the imaginative projections that preoccupy you always in your, in your business as a child, as you go about your business of living out your destiny as a child, and you find the imaginative projections from within yourself when you're by yourself in your backyard playing, and you become that thing. And so how fortunate, how fortunate one would be learning how to read as a child, learning how to enjoy literature as a child, where you could go and read about nature, about, ooh, bears and plants and wolves and uh, Native Americans and wood lore and, and, and cowboys and historical figures of legend. And then you could read about them and learn about them and turn the pages and go through those kind of motions but all the time it was creating something more in your mind, an impetus, which you would follow when you went out to play. And in the free play of your imagination as a child, you would see bodied forth the imaginative projections that you, you read from the pages. And, and all of this feeds, feeds into so many other, like what, uh, junctures of thought and conglomerations of thought that each have their own momentum that draw you forward. This is how we learn to conceive of our identities. Or this is one way. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are as many ways as there are people. But this is how we learn how to conceive of our, the track of our destination as poets from, from early childhood. Because it opens up. We're at, still at the edge, unformed. We're still at the edge of certain possibilities that are always universal in human beings. 
and um, we can still imagine ourselves as being among the primordial people. So we learn how to appreciate things in that way. And then as time goes on, our methods of research become more sophisticated. Oftentimes that's a drawback, but sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes we have access to certain materials, annals, records, archives. And as we grow, and um, as the mind takes on more layers of uh, discipline in absorbing and assimilating information, um, sometimes, you know, like breaking through the strata, through all the layers of sophistication, the layers of impressions, the demands, the fluctuations in our changing identities, sometimes there is like uh, some kind of like uh, echoing resonation when we come across some idea or inkling which draws us back into the ancient sources of what originally set our minds on fire. These are general terms of like a mythic Bildungsroman. So it has a very specific kind of like manifestation which we will explore tonight, I guess is, is, is one way to begin to look at, at our subject. Um, well, I want to consider a, a, legendary, um, a legendary kind of destiny, a legend in our times. Um, because, okay, I want to consider how it is that a certain kind of like gifted um, conglomeration of literary associations becomes available to us. And so I want to see if we can draw that out then. And so like when I speak of like a mythical and legendary uh, destiny, <laughs> uh, there are many legends in their own time, are there not? And, you know, in some sense, we are all legends in our own time. But those among us who, whose vocation has been worked out in the in the public eye so that it's become available to us so that we can like look at it as a mirror and try to come to an under, understanding of ourselves. Um, there is, you know, is one we will explore tonight. You know, I have to mention his name and, you know, you know, God bless him. <clears throat> but Gary Snyder as a student, well, I first want to say, um, <laughs> Gary Snyder as a child, and this is part of, 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 of what he, um, writes about, and, and speaks of again and again as a child when growing up north of Seattle in a small farm, um, he was, had access to the public library. This is what I'm talking about in a certain sense. Some of this could be a peon to the notion of the public library, how common and yet how precious. But for Gary Snyder as a child in the public library, his mother taking, um, having deep insight into the development of her child found it a good thing to do to bring him to the library again and again where he would devour the books on the shelves. But as he says it again and again, he was drawn to the nature sections and he was drawn to writers like Ernest Thompson Seton and um, some of the early, you know, childhood authors who wrote about nature because you could read these things and assimilate them in your growing, in your growing, you know, trained mind as it grew into the form it would take in adulthood and, and on and on through the course of one's life. But at the same time, uh, it was feeding, you know, a more primordial and, and kind of joyful and free understanding of existence, which is embodied in what we sometimes disparagingly call child's play. And it feeds the imagination. It fed his imagination. And um, somehow that continued to be an inspiring force um, when later on as a student, in, as a college student, he came upon in the stacks at, at, at the was it the library? Was it his college library? Um, there were um, bound in olive drab coverings the um, editions of the uh, Bureau of, of American Ethnology. I hope I'm not I'm mispronouncing the names of these agencies. A U.S. government agency, which existed from, oh, 
the 1860s, perhaps, or the, no, uh, probably the 1870s, until about the middle 1960s, um, the Bureau of American Ethnology. And there are many and many bound volumes of um, anthropologists and linguists and ethnographers who were commissioned by universities and sometimes by government grants to go out and to gather together um, so as to have a form, you know, as, as, as a gathering, as a, as a form, as transcriptions of all of these primordial cultures that had been for so long subject to such destructive influences, you know, in, in this, this great melding and shifting and changing of, 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 of cultures and worlds that, that has been, that, well, it's probably the sum, the sum substance of, of, of our history as a species. Um, but there are those, it's the work of scholarship, and it's the work of individuals following their own guiding star who go out and seek and trace and gather what they can, what they can identify, what they can come to understand of the cultural legacy of all of those cultures that have been there before us or that have been assimilated by us or that have been eroded or the destructive influences of, of time and change and all the forms that they take, all the charged forms that they take. There is still a way to make it so that something remains, and that is the written word. And what, you know, the written word and the spoken word and the listened to word and the word heard in the mind, all of these are manifestations of the living word. The living word, a mythical concept, really, with... Uh, presented through religion after religion and theology after theology and, and uh, poetic education after poetic education, the, the, the living word. But I want to suggest to you a theory in play, a theory that the living word is a threshold and but also a filter and also like a passing through place. The living word is the space between the unsayable, so vast and unknown, and the unknowable, so deep and so wild. And the living word is this kind of like mm, passing through place where we can kind of come to a creative understanding, alive in sight only for a moment. And that's another little itty-bitty quote from Jack Spicer. It's interesting to quote him now, to think of him in this way, because one wouldn't normally think of him as being, um, well, there's so many ways to think of like avant-garde and, and um, esoteric and oblique and all of this stuff. But we are a coastal people, to quote a phrase from Jack Spicer. Poetry something to the effect of, is alive in sight only for a moment. Poetry is alive in sight only for a second. And then he says later on in this particular poem, I'm thinking of, the birds are still in flight. Believe the birds. Poetry is alive in sight only for a second. The birds, the birds of thought, are still in flight. Believe the birds. And... Uh, let us remember our mentor, the god Hermes, who saw upon the muddy river banks the track of the heron and the tracks of the other birds and found from these winged creatures the tracks of their feet left tracings upon the impress impressionable surface of clay that, that brought to mind, to the godly mind, suggestions of letters which we would form into alphabets. And let us not forget also the the living word and 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 uh, in the beginning was the word because you cannot have a beginning which is a word without a word which is the word which was the beginning the living word but I say to you now these are primordial in the beginning but they are also to us liminal flashes of intuition and inspiration and insight and interestingly enough we must also use the word filters because they allow something to pass through them 
which can still offer us some kind of energy or some kind of substance to create a world of meaning which will allow everything that has influenced us or inspired us in the past to go on into the future to contribute to the long evolution of this species, which is, you know, the human, the human species, which is, um, has, takes part in all other species, in the mirror of their consciousness, which is the most characteristic element of the human species, is consciousness, but consciousness not only as a mirror of phenomenon, phenomena, but consciousness as uh, a means to speak or to bring forth a response to all the impressions, physical and um, non-physical, that, that somehow leave their traces. And the traces are what we write or what we paint or what we draw or the, the outlines of the literary forms that we come to work with and come to understand as we work with them. Anyway, so there's our hero, Gary Snyder, reaching into the stacks and finding, oh, from the Bureau of American Ethnology, uh, on, in the pages, um, the story of a deep and significant and beautiful encounter, which is so formative to our literary consciousness, our spiritual consciousness, which I would like to, to somehow like bring forth out of the um, blurry shadows. So um, there was, um, uh, you know, inspired thinkers abound everywhere. And it is only um, our ability to understand the inspirations that um, allow us to see them as inspired thinkers, inspired givers, inspired culture, um, creators, culture formers, culture contributors. And in the, in the pages of the Bureau of American Ethnology, um, our heroic reader, our exemplary reader, and as Walt Whitman says, the greatest teacher is the one who makes of, of, of themselves the greatest and whole living example. So, well, I must be forgiven for, for drawing upon um, heroic figures, you know, and, and, and presenting their stories as if it was really this way, and maybe it was. You know, but anyway, so there's our heroic reader, Gary Snyder, and he's turning the pages and he's reading about an encounter which happened in a remote place and about at the, at the threshold of the previous century <laughs> of the 1900s, of the 20th century, at the threshold, the filter, the liminal dwelling place of the beginning of the 20th century in some uh, 1900. And uh, there was an individual from, um, probably it was Harvard or Columbia or, or some, an East Coast Ivy League school. There was an anthropologist and a linguist named John Swanton. And John Swanton had in turn been inspired by a great scholar and thinker by the name of Franz Boas, B-O-A-S, Franz Boas, an anthropologist. We must... Always keep in mind the contributions that the anthropologists of the 20th century have made to our understandings of, of all the various branching traces and lines and ramos implications of poetics discovered by anthropologists who, with, you know, I mean, you can speak of all the different kind of like forms of thought in academic uh, styles, you know, such as structuralism and all of this. And, and those, are, those two are strictures, disciplines, strictures, filters, limits, distortions, perhaps. And nevertheless, through such academic styles, inspiration continues to, 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 to go on. And, and, and is picked up again and again. And, and it's a flawed process, but folks, it's the human process. Anyway, um, so, so, you know, trained in a, by Franz Boas and others, um, John Swanton finds himself on a project um, as a linguist and an ethnologist from the East Coast, um, 
there he is in September of 1900 in um, a remote archipelago 90 miles off the coast of British Columbia. 90 miles off the coast of British Columbia at the edge of the deep sea, at the Mar Mar Marianas Trench. I mean, of the wild and deep sea, there's this group of islands, wooded islands. There's water aplenty and there's bears and other creatures. Um, and there live the people, the Haida people, the Haida people, Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest. Mm, I don't know, uh, some miles south of Alaska and, you know, well north of Vancouver and then like I say, 90 miles out on the edge of the deep blue ocean in its, some of its deepest parts, deepest, uh, deepest areas. Um, there live the Haida people. And bless them, <laughs> because these anthropologists knew that there was um, still... It was still possible to go there and 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 to record for posterity, to use a crude term, to record um, what still was rich of a, a, a deep and fascinating and and pervasive and yet also damaged uh, culture. We can speak of this on and on, but it just could be said, you know, and you can draw the rest of your conclusions, I mean, from this. But um, the Haida people in their land, um, 90 miles off the coast of British Columbia, called uh, uh, Haida Gwaii, that's the name of the archipelago, this group of islands, but it is also called uh, the Queen Charlotte Islands. Interestingly enough, the Queen Charlotte Islands, Queen Charlotte was the... Um, the, the consort of the Mad King, the Mad King George III. And so this island was named after her, the Queen Charlotte Islands, by, by the people who claimed it as, 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 as their own, uh, according to the, the way that they saw the world. But the people who were the original inhabitants of that world, they called it Haida Gwaii. And it was and it was their land, but but in the course of uh, starting in about the middle of the 19th century, over the course of about 50 years before John Swanton came there, the anthropologist from the East Coast, uh, for, in the course of like 50 years, the population of of, of people of the Haida uh, in the archipelago called the Haida Gwaii had been decimated. Like 90 percent of the population was lost to what? disease, successive waves of disease, smallpox, measles, syphilis, you know, contact with, you know, the, the culture that was um, becoming ascendant, to use all these crude terms, um, brought pestilence and, and, and plague and disease. And um, so many of the villages had to be um, abandoned and left behind, because it, it, who can speak and who can really tell, you know, of, of, of just what can happen in this world? And yet, these people had imaginations. These people had arts. These people had skills. These people had a relationship with not only their own world, but all the other worlds all around it, the animal world and the spirit world and the world of the land and the world of the plants and the world of the ocean and all of the teeming life forms in all the worlds. And it was reflected in their culture and in their lore. And it was somehow still there. And on that hope, on that insight, on that inspiration, John Swanton went there in 1900. And he had, you know, some knowledge of Haida. He could sort of speak it. And, but he, what he was interested in, though, was literary Haida. What he was interested in, though, was the literature and the mythology and the um, visionary topography of an oral culture. The words were kept in the form of spoken utterances and in the form of stories and all the forms that they take. 
And um, there were still some living storytellers who were still there. And John Swanton made it his task to go there and transcribe those works from the mouths of those who told those original stories. And that is what he did. And he had, of course, um, help. Um, Henry Moody, this was his, uh, his uh, what, Anglo name. Um, Henry Moody was, was a native Haida himself, and a younger one, you know, 20 years old or 20 in his 20s, younger, but he had working knowledge. Well, he had knowledge of English and he had knowledge of Haida. And um, he was the one who was kind of the anamnuesis of, of John Swanton, who uh, transcribed phonetically in phonetic script um, with his, you know, linguistic training. And um, Henry Moody, who assisted in repeating the sentences to him sentence by sentence. Tedious work, but necessary to make sure that what was heard would be what was recorded, right? A passing through of many different mediums in order to give, give us what we are sort of coming to understand now. Miraculous, complicated, and I'm beginning to understand it, maybe. And maybe we all are beginning to understand it. But anyway, there was... So John Swanton, there was Henry Moody, and then there was there, and then there was someone else, and that was Gondol. Gondol's Anglo name was um, Walter McGregor. <laughs> he was given that name by uh, a Methodist missionary who, I guess, had you know an interest in in Scottish names, and um, so Gondol, which in Haida means spring water or creek water or clear water, Gondol. Uh, Gondol was given the, name, given the name Walter McGregor. Gondol was one of the, what, the tiny portion of Haida who survived, you know, the uh, continual string of pestilences. And we don't know um, whether it was um, smallpox or measles that when Gondol was a young man, took away his sight. So Gondol made himself useful to his community, his immediate community, and by virtue of that, to the world. And that means us, because what else does the world mean but us, when we, when we come to this juncture in our process, um, made available to the world and as, as his task, as his vocation, as a poet as a storyteller. Um, he was a living repository of the, the stories and the textures and the visions and the turns of events and the chronicles of his people, not only of his people, but, but, of, but of the world of his people and all the other worlds that it impinges on, including our world now, no less than those of the raven and the cormorant and the dogfish and the mountains and the ferns and, um, and all of these things. And they were there in his living imagination, in his living word as a threshold between the unsayable and the unnameable. It was there in Gondol. And Gondol brought himself and all he knew to, to this place with this, uh, this anthropologist, right? This uh, fellow with his hat and his box and his, what, his tent and his um, pages and his papers. And he's from a long way away. And, oh, yeah, I kind of know that uh, language that he speaks and he wants to hear from us. Uh, for me, the stories, and, and there's, okay, I, there's, there's Henry Moody, and so he asks me to tell the stories, and so Gondol told the stories, and um, I guess it was like something like 11 months between September and August in 1900 and 1901 that the laborious work was um, undertaken, and um, story after story from Gondol and from also some of these other myth tellers, individuals, uh, that they were transcribed. And 
in being transcribed, they became the pages of a book and they became the pages of the editions of the annals of the Bureau of American Ethnology. And there they were, literal translations. Um, and that has its own attraction for those who know how to understand him understand them and those who are following their nose so to speak sometimes the literal translation is what is least subject to the distortions you know of all the um, preconceptions of those who might what embellish it or simplify it or smooth it out or make it accord to their own way of seeing things at any rate um, we have to it seems that the story is told in this way by me at this point in time, you know, with, with what I know, that um, Gary Snyder found, he found Swanton's work. And not all of Swanton's work, but he found Swanton's work in that period of time on, on Haida Gwaii, and he found the stories, um, he found a specific story by Gondol, um, told by Gondol uh, as part of the... The, the 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 myth time the dream time of his, of his people um the, more than one story but what what gary snyder found was the story that that was titled in in swanton's literal transcription or maybe translation he who hunted birds in his father's village that's the name of it um as gary snyder found it and um a young man but with the inspirations that are demonic, by which I mean to say, you know, that in all of us, you know, sometimes we notice it, sometimes it's important for us to notice it, sometimes it doesn't matter, sometimes we think we notice it, other times we, we do notice it but don't realize it. The demonic inspirations, the things that were in us from the very beginning, the things that we brought with us into the world, what we brought with us as acorns, even as we became oak trees, uh, within the acorn, there was still the oak. And so there was some kind of inspiration that was unique to Gary Snyder from the time when he was a child following his own interests, which he still continued to follow at the time when he discovered this, uh, this, this, this story in this you know, crude and academic form, in this literalized form, in the dusty stacks of the library. And he found this weird story with weird moods and bizarre changes and very compelling. And it, uh, you know, it spoke to him. And destiny made it fortunate for, for, for him and for all of us that destiny, it was the destiny of this tale to come to us, well, through many people, through Gondel, through Moody, through Swanton, through Snyder, through the nameless bureaucrats who made it possible for this journal to be, uh, you know, brought to the attention of college students or to be made available for college students. And, you know, you cannot trace all the different strands of inspiration, oh, and it's so uh, blurry and almost like it's just, it's daunting to try and piece it out and to see, but, but this, is, this is how it is, right? This is how things work, and this is how it goes on. This is how culture and, and inspiration is transmitted in these strange ways. And so mm, he took that story and his um, interest in that story and went to work and went to work and made it into a beautiful um, thesis, an undergraduate thesis, which, um, you know, became an early manifestation of his vocation as poet and as scholar. And even though it's the work of, of a youngster, um, in some ways, right, in the immediate form, you know, like an academic paper, what is contained with it is, is, is inspiration that overleaps its bounds just like any story, or like any good story, like any primordial story. Mm -hmm. And so this, this story titled with the literal title, He Who Hunted Birds in His Father's Village, a Haida myth. Um, well, right away you can, you can say about it, you know, a, another mystery about it, you know, some, borrowing from the language of taxonomy and classification. It is a... a it is one of those um, swan people myths. 
It is a certain kind of story that we see in many, many other cultures. All over the world, the same pattern of a story of some human who falls in love with a feathered creature, with a winged creature, and uh, their forms change so that they are allowed to dwell together intimately and romantically. But because they are from a different species, their um, the differences in their destinies play out, and it you know it becomes very very poignant. And you see it the Swan Maiden stories. You know you see it in Hans Christian Andersen. You see it in Grimm. You see it in the Celtic tales with mm, so many luscious and um, deep variations. And strangely enough, you know, these stories, they have within themselves the seeds of their own selves overleaping. They travel. They migrate. And how do they do this? They're not written down. They're not broadcast by social media or electronic means of anything like this. And, oh, sometimes you can objectively trace you know, the passage of tales and lore through trading routes and uh, cultural contact and all this. And sometimes you just can't. It's almost as if they spontaneously arise. From where? From the deep sources of the human imagination. And they are there and they manifest as weird flowerings. And if you have eyes to see, you can trace it out in in. in whatever partial way, you know, according to your own interests, and you can find, and you can ask yourself, how is it, you know, how is it, poetically poets, we ask ourselves often, do we not, how is it that culture is transmitted from age to age? I mean, we know the obvious ways, but what about the oblique ways? What about the, you know, unspoken ways? What about the threshold kind of ways? How is culture transmitted from age to age? Well, at the same time, also, well, is it culture that is transmitted uh, from culture to culture in literary form? Or is it more of a spontaneous flowering or rising? It is just purely a phenomena, And all we can do is just stand back and just kind of look and say, okay, here it comes again, you know, like a meteorological phenomenon. Here's a manifestation of this kind of tale, and here's that kind of tale. And, oh, yes, what has some, in some way made us aware of it is, is, is scientific anthropological language, you know, of, of classifications, and classifications that speak to other classifications, types of folk tale. They started studying it this way long, long ago, before the modernists. <laughs> But the modernists picked up on it in a really creative way, like T.S. Eliot in The Wasteland. You know, you read the notes and you read about Sir James Fraser and the Golden Bough and all that stuff, Victorian-era anthropologists. Well, Swanton came after that a little bit. Franz Boas came sort of after that. They were working in, in um, well, they were just, I, I, I don't want to generalize too much about that, but, but these um, primordial people had this kind of like, symbolic way of relating to the world, this mythic way of relating to the world, these um, oral literatures and these stories with their motifs and their themes and their images, which seem to strangely resonate in all of these other cultures. And so mm, this is the, the, the strange tracing that we follow. Perhaps it's, perhaps it's a single and magical letter of the alphabet, a constellation of meanings, you know, of all these changes in, in myth and folklore and, and tale and image and vision. And perhaps the only way that we as individual human beings can experience the way that they change their forms is in our own selves, in our own phenomenology of thought, in our own, dare I say it, sensual contours of thought. For what is poetry but thought made sensual? Hmm. What is poetry but thought made sensual in the sense of thought made available to the ear as sound, uh, to the inner eye through the medium of the living word? You don't see it with your eyes, your but you still see it with the eye within your eye, you could say. But, you know, that's a metaphor to express a metaphorical reality. It is the language of myth. It is a way of understanding reality. And science has 
its way of understanding what we call science, and that word is loaded and charged and vague and made, you know, a political pawn of various ideologies, science. What the word means is knowledge. Um, and mythology, what the word means, mythology, myth means story, report, uh, accounting. Um, it means... Um, happening or event, mythology, myth and logos, mythology. Well, individual myths take part in these larger entities called mythologies. And these mythologies, what makes a mythology a mythology? Um, it is a way of understanding reality. What makes a myth a myth? A myth is a myth because it seems to um, express an understanding of reality in such a way that it can be discovered and rediscovered again and again and again by all these other cultures and by all of these other individuals, each in their own way. And there is something about it that uh, inscrutably compels it to be uh, discovered and rediscovered again and again and again as an understanding of reality. Myth, you know, this is what myth is. And Well, what is then um, poetry then? I mean, well, we in our culture perhaps have come to understand poetry, uh, conventionally speaking, as, as, as verse as words arranged in such a way according to, um, you know, formal structures that have to do with um, sound and rhythm and rhyme and accent and, you know, on, on the page, you know, this is verse. And what is prose according to the conventional way we have come to understand it, which, you know, is shedding its own skin even as we speak. Science is constantly being revised if it is true to itself. Mythology is constantly being revised as it is true to itself in the minds of poets, uh, both in their own way, constantly changing. Um, anyway, uh, prose, well, what is prose? It is like what? An ordering of conceptual sequences of thought which mirror the societies in which written arts are, are practiced. You know, the agricultural societies, um, you know, agricultural societies um, and, and, and prose became um, ordered along the same lines as like boundaries of fields and rows of crops and you know, orchards and um, the tabulations of the fruits of the field, and all of these things kind of like lent their orderly structure to the progressions of prose, the progression of like ideas and sequence, concepts and sequence. And verse became mm, progressions of ideas and language set according to forms such as rhyme and rhythm and accent and sound, P verse and prose. And um, this became kind of an understanding of literature, which is restrictive, which is distorting, and which uh, it depends upon poets to see what's really going on in, in that kind of like a um, conventional arrangement. And one must ask themselves, perhaps Gary Snyder asked himself, reading this story and understanding it as story, listening you understand, listening to the story as he read it on the page, listening to the human reality, to the human imaginative visionary reality that was conveyed in almost in spite of itself, you know, through the, through the literal, through the literal arrangements, the literal transcriptions of the words on the page, somehow something more was being conveyed to the intuition of the sensitive reader, the sensitive reader who is represented in this story by, by Gary Snyder. Um, the sensitive reader who sees the, the, the imagine, who reads imaginatively and understands the world that, uh, out of which these expressions are coming. And, you know, Swanton, think of the tedium 
and the hours spent there in a land strange to him. I just want to mention he was Swedenborgian, and, and, and which is like, you know, a religion full of like deep spiritual intuitive understanding. And, and somehow I feel like, not that it's like um, something we can ever put our finger on, but um, just the intuitive openness of what he was doing, transcribing the words as words, listening in a way that he had never heard anything before because such a unique endeavor is what he was doing, transcribing these ancient myths would require one to step into a different realm of understanding in relation to the living word as it was being embodied in that particular moment at that particular time and to take part in one's own being, in, in one's own unique place, in, in such a work, in such a manifestation of the living word is such, such a wonderful thing to do, so much so that we're talking about it right now and still trying to tease out you know, what compels our, our, our interest in it. So, so anyway, all of this is somehow suggested in the pages. And then the story itself is somehow put into words in such a way that it becomes a living thing that accrues to itself, you know, the, the interests, that the interest in it that, that, that still inspires us now. So, um, and what it was, it was an incident. What it was, it was a happening. What it was, you know, was a myth. And what is a myth but something that happened? I mean, it was just there. It wasn't something that one could think of. It was something that just was there. Don't know where it came from, but it just so happened that there he was. He was the son of a chief, and um, he was going through the bull pines, a certain kind of tree, and he was hunting, and he was hunting birds, and he came to the edge of a lake, a body of water, and he saw two women swimming, and on the shore were two feathered, feathered things, why? They were, they were goose skins. And he had a couple of Martin skins. That's kind of a symbol of prosperity, perhaps of aristocracy among the Haida. And he saw the two goose skins, and he saw the two women swimming, and he watched them for a while. And there was one in particular that he was attracted to. And he went, he must have known some of the ancient magic, or he must have known what to do. He went and sat upon the goose skins with, oh, what was it now they say, white spots near the tails. He sat upon them, and the two women looked and realized that they had been found out by a human, because indeed they were, they were geese, and they were swimming in their father's water, and now there was a human being sitting on their skins, and that meant that they couldn't change back into geese. And um, they saw him there, and he said to them that he wanted to marry, he wanted to marry you, he said to one of them, the one that he was attracted to. That was the younger sister, the story tells us. The older sister said, oh no, marry me, I am smarter. That's what she said. And he said, no, no, I want to marry that one. And so the older one said, well, all right then, give me back my goose skin. And so he gave her back her goose skin and she put it on and then she became a goose. And then she flew in the sky and she circled in the sky. And Gondol tells us, because let's remember now, Gondol is expressing, and let us, it is my fervent hope that some element of Gondol as a stylist, as an individual, that some element of his vision somehow is still alive now as it, as it passes through all the forms that it passes through, um, even now. Um, she was loath, says Gondol in so many words. She was loath to leave her sister. She flew in the sky, uh, calling out and honking. And then she took her leave. She ascended up, up, up into the sky, and she disappeared through the very top of the sky returning to her own world. 
And the other sister, she came ashore and she said, very well then, we will be married, you and I. And they walked together back to his father's house. And he gave her one of his Martin skins. He still had the goose skin. As they were walking to his father's house, walking back to town, you understand, walking back to the world of the humans, he put the goose skin in between two upper branches of a red cedar tree, maybe squirreling it away, caching it away, secreting it away, perhaps. And they continued on their way. And they came to um, the town of people, and they came to his father's house, and they celebrated the wedding in the way weddings were celebrated. And, and there she was, you know, she was willingly with him. It is a love story. They loved each other, really, but it was a love that crossed worlds, and that has those poignant elements, among which is just the day-to-day -day life. There she was, and she couldn't eat the human food. She couldn't eat the human food until they brought some steamed silverweed, which is a plant that grows, you know, at, at the at the creek head, and and they steam it. And also, it is called, I believe, the Haida word is taklal steamed silverweed, and they offered steamed silverweed, and oh, she ate that. She liked that, because that's what geese also eat. And so, after that, they had steamed silverweed, and, and they were married, and um, they were living together, and the story tells us, Gondal tells us, that sometimes, though, when he was lying abed at night, his wife lying next to him, her skin seemed cold or damp, and he wondered about this. And so the story tells us that one night she was not there. So he got up and he went out, outside, and he found her. She was walking toward the red cedar tree. She reached in between the two upper branches of the red cedar tree and put on her goose skin once more and was a goose. And this was at night. And she flew to the edge of the sea, and there she ate some of the seagrass, eating the tops of the heads of the seagrass as a goose, while the waves um, brought her closer and closer to the shore. And his curiosity satisfied, he realized that what was happening, so he went back home. He lay in bed, and a short time later she returned, and her skin was cold and damp, but now he knew why. You know, so suggestive. This is a true and real life. But you know how it is when you're reading the Ancestral Chronicles. You just read these odd details, almost as if they were literal transcriptions, and then it's up to you to put together in your own mind what kind of world, what kind of life together that they had. Well, Haida Gwaii, this land, is water is plentiful, and trees and wood are plentiful. But still, sometimes, food can be scarce, and hunger came upon the land. During the time that these two were living together, hunger came uh, to the town, to the people. And one, one afternoon, she said, My father is bringing us food through the sky. What? What? said the husband. Come and see. And they went to the edge of town, and they saw many, many, many geese. And the geese seemed to be coming down from the top of the sky. And the geese uh, gathered and flocked together and then flew away. But what they had brought down from the sky was uh, silverweed, taklo, and wild clover root, and all kinds of edible green things for the people to eat. And... Um, his father, the husband's father, called the people together and they, they ate this food which is made available to them by the geese, by his daughter-in-law, you might say. And this happened once. And when that food ran out, it happened another time. She said, my father is bringing food through the clouds. And they went to the edge of town to look and they had silver weed and, red, and wild clover root once more. And they ate. And... um. But these societies are every bit as complicated as ours are. Human, the human, the human self, whatever you want to call it. Um, think, people say things. And the story tells us that at some point, someone said about her, My, 
my, my, she sure does have uh, a fondness for that goose food. And this was deeply insulting and deeply hurtful and deeply offensive. And um, she became a goose. And he said to her, come back, come back. And oh, Gondel tells us, she flew in circles over the town. Ah, and her heart was reluctant to leave her husband, but some kind of etiquette had been breached. Mm, some kind of hurt had been inflicted, and she flew in circles, calling out with regret, but then, as her older sister did so long before, she ascended into the sky through the very top of the sky, becoming smaller and small, smaller like a speck and finally disappearing. And oh, the husband was loath to see her go. And he went up and down the roads of the village weeping because he missed her. She was in another world, but he wanted to go there. How can I find my wife? He asked himself, weeping walking up and down the roads of the village, and an old man in a lodge, an old man in a dwelling, noticed him and took pity upon him, had compassion for him, and said, Now, this is what you must do. Well, let me tell you what has happened, young man. You have fallen in love with a maiden whose mother and father are not of this world. Their world is far beyond ours. And yet, if you are seeking her, I can help you. This is what you must have. This is what you must gather. Go out and find some things. First of all, you need a, a pointed marlin spike or a gimlet, which is a, a, wood, a woodworking tool they had, which you bore into trees with. Go and find a gimlet. Go and find some good braided spruce cord Go and bring me the skin of a coho salmon, a silver salmon skin, it is sometimes called. Go and find a box of salmon eggs. Go and find the spear point of a salmon spear. Go and find some oil. Go and find a comb. These are some of the things that you will need if you want to take the journey to go and find your wife in her world. And so the story seems to indicate some kind of gift exchange occurred. He gave the man some kind of gifts and the man told him the things that he needed to have and he got those things that the man mentioned. And then he set off. Oh, and he said the trail, the small trail here at the edge of the village, follow that and that will take you. That will take you to the world where your wife is. And so he followed that trail. And um, he was going along there. Now, what did he find? And who did he find at first? Yes, uh, if I recollect it uh, correctly, he was going along the road. And already he was leaving this world because he began to see some strange things. He began to see, like, there was an individual there on the trail who was infested with lice. The small bugs were crawling over his skin, so much so that he tried to rid himself of the lice by turning around quickly. Like, what was he doing? Trying to outrun the lice that were on him? But he couldn't do it. He was some kind of supernatural being, yet he was afflicted. And he was tormented by many, many, many crawling lice. And he was turning around in himself, trying to free himself from him, when along came the husband, searching for his wife. And... This supernatural lice-infested being saw him and noticed that the other was looking at him and said to him, strangely enough, Why do you tickle me with your eyes? Because evidently supernatural beings feel the sight of human beings on them as kind of a tickling sensation. Talk about the sensuality of thought, maybe. Could it be like that? Talk about the pure phenomenon of the whatever impressions in our living forms, however they reach us, however we describe them. What can we say? Well, it seems sometimes true to say to be seen means to be tickled by the sight of another. Why do you tickle me with your sight? Help me! I am infested with lice! And the husband said, Ah, I can help you. I've got this. And he brought out his oil. I've got this. 
and he brought out his comb, no doubt a fine-toothed comb. And he combed and combed and oiled and oiled, and soon the lice were gone. And the supernatural being was grateful to be rid of all these crawling lice. And he said, ah, the road to your wife is this way. He expressed his gratitude by showing him the way. There was a reciprocal exchange of gifts between the worlds. And so he continued on that way. Now, he was walking along and he noticed something that got his own attention independently of anything that he was told or expected to see. But he was going through this lush, piney forest, hemlock forest, and there was a fallen log. And there, trying to cross over the fallen log, was a little mouse with a cranberry in her mouth. And the little mouse couldn't get over the fallen log. And so, out of uh, a basic desire to help, other living beings, the husband searching for his wife, reached down with his hand, palm open, and he placed it on the ground, and the mouse crawled onto his hand with the cranberry in her mouth, and he lifted the mouse over the fallen tree stump. And the mouse was so joyful to cross the fallen tree stump that she looked up at him with her bright round eyes, and the story tells us, Gondel tells us, that her tail in delight curved flat over her back all the way to the top of her head between her ears, and as a signal of her, you know, excited and squirming delight, and then away the little mouse disappeared through the ferns. And so, well, the human being, he continued on his way, having helped a mouse with a cranberry in her mouth. And um, after a time, he came to a wall of ferns. Couldn't see through the other side. But then, as he parted the fronds, he saw a door. It was the door of a large house. A voice, a polite voice, round like the brown eyes of a mouth, of a mouse, excuse me, her voice round like the round brown eyes of a mouse, Gondol tells us, beckoned him to enter, enter, and he entered, and he found himself in a large house, and it was the house of the mouse woman, only it was now in her world. And she said, I was bringing back a poor little cranberry from my cranberry patch over yonder, and you helped me So let me do something good for you. Here is something that I used to use when I was younger and would go a-hunting. Here is something that I will give to you. And she went to her shelf and she took down a box and she opened up the box and she took out another box and she opened up that box and she took out another box and she opened up that box and she took out another box. She opened up, uh, what was it now, five boxes in all and the last box she opened was the smallest box of all. She opened it up and inside was a mouse skin with tiny bent claws, a tiny little mouse skin. And she said, here, This is something that I give to you. This will help you find your wife, but you've got to learn how to use it. And so, what did he do? He took this tiny mouse skin with the little bent claws, so small, and he put it on. And then he was a mouse. And then he was a mouse crawling on the wall of Mouse Woman's house. And then he was a mouse crawling up on the ceiling. And then he was a mouse crawling up and down, all around. And Mouse Woman said, okay, you know how to use it. (laughs) Now be on your way. And so then he was on his way. And so (laughs) with the mouse skin, I suppose, in a box, he he continued on his way. And um, well, he continued on his way. And the next one he saw was a woman with a heavy, heavy load. She was carrying on her back layers and layers of flat stones, flat stones, plates of stone. She was carrying them on her back, but they kept falling off. Not only were they heavy, but the load could not be secured because the cords of twine were not holding. But The young man remembered what the older one had given him. He had some of these braided spruce fiber cords, and he said, here, let me help you secure your load. And so he used those cords to secure her load of stones so that she was able to carry them on her back. 
And then she gratefully departed on her way, but not before saying that she said she too was a supernatural being, referring to other supernatural beings beyond her, when she said, they have me carrying the mountains of Haida Gwaii upon my back. You have helped me to secure my load. So the trail to your wife goes on here. And she showed him the way. And he followed the way. And he followed the way till he came to a strange sight. A hillock, a mound. And out of that mound there was a pole, a pillar, that went all the way up, 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 beyond the reach of the sight of the eyes. And scattered around the ground, around this pillar, pillar were bones, human bones, an indicator of perilousness. But he knew this was the way to the world above. And he knew the way to get there. And the older one at the edge of the village had given him or, or had him procure a box of salmon eggs. And he put on the mouse skin and became a mouse. And then, as a mouse, with the tiny bent claws, he made his way up the pole, pushing the salmon eggs before him, as if to smooth his way all the way up to the upper world. And he did get there. <laughs> he did get to the upper world. And when he got to the upper world, he saw a world with trees and rivers, much like our world. But, you know, things were different. He saw specifically, what made it different was what he saw specifically now that he was in the upper world. He saw a roaring river, and it was running high. And, and the water was roaring along the boulders, and on one side was an eagle, and on the other side of the river was a bear, and um, farther up the river there was a kingfisher. Gondal tells us this. Gondal, you know, doesn't see with his eyes, but he sure does know birds, and he does know the animals. He knows them cognitively. He knows what they do in the sense of, of, of the poetic nature of what they do that can be transmitted to us, his descendants as human beings, striving to understand with our imaginations through myth the things that are true. Anyway, Gondel tells us that the young man saw there was an eagle on one side of the stream. What was it now? An eagle on one side, a heron on the other side. Oh, and, the, and there was a bear, an eagle and a heron, and a bear and a kingfisher. Oh, but the bear was calling to the eagle. The bear was saying, Grandfather, he said this to the eagle. The bear was saying, Grandfather, you've got to help me. You need to give me something. And the bear held up his paws. And the eagle said, Oh, you need claws. You need claws for your paws. Let me give you claws for your paws, oh bear. And the eagle gave the bear claws. And the young man saw this, and he saw that it was, he saw this, and then, and then he went on his way. Mm -hmm. And he continued on his way, and he came to a stream, a roaring stream of water. The land is, there's lots of water in the land, as I might have mentioned. And he saw another supernatural being, a strange one this time. Sometimes they call him uh, the stick-walking god. Gondol sometimes, I've seen it translated as Master Hopper, the Master Hopper. Why does Master Hopper hop? Master Hopper hops because he only has one leg. Master Hopper is only one half of a human form, half a head, half a torso, one leg, one arm. Master Hopper was there, and Master Hopper was fishing, of course, for salmon, and Master Hopper had his spear, and Master Hopper was after the salmon, and the young man saw Master Hopper, the half of a human form, doing what the half of the human form was doing in this world above the world, and remembering what he had been given by the elder who helped him at the edge of the village, he put on the skin 
of the coho salmon. He put on the silver salmon skin, and so he became a salmon, swimming in the water of the river. And Master Hopper, the half-being, saw the silver salmon swimming and thrust his spear. And the spear disappeared into the water, and the string, the rope or the twine attached to the spear was cut. And Master Hopper drew the spear back, or drew the string back, and saw that it had been it had been cut. And Master Hopper looked down in the water where he thought there were just salmon, and just said, very Zen-like, "Sometimes human beings do this. Sometimes human beings do this." Well, a short time later, he was approached by a human being, and it was, of course. The young man looking for his wife. He had taken off his silver salmon skin and now appeared as a human being. And he had been given, or he had gathered for himself on the advice of the elder at the edge of the village. He had something that um, Master Hopper had recently lost. And the young man said, Master Hopper, have you lost a spear? And Master Hopper said, Yes, I thrust my spear, and the twine was cut. Sometimes human beings do this. Well, the young man said, Well, I have a spear. Here's a salmon spear that you can use. Here, use this one. I'm giving it to you since you have lost your own. <laughs> and so Master Hopper took that spear and said, I am grateful. This is the road to your wife. <laughs> Showed him the road, and the young man continued on that road. And he came to some windfall trees. I don't know if they were spruce or if they were hemlock. Gondel tells us that they were fallen to the ground and that they were rotten, meaning that they were soft and there were chips. And chips chipped, it was chipping and falling apart as logs do in the forest. And there were these two supernatural beings and they were in the form of fat old men. And they were um, chopping with their... Um, what was it now? They were chopping with their wedges. Yeah, they were chopping with their wedges and their axes. And with every chop, 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 the chips flew. The wood chips flew. And they would pick up the wood chips and throw them into the river. And the wood chips became salmon. And um, the young man approached them and realized that he needed to do something uh, to help them so that they could give him the advice he sought about which trail to follow. And um, he had been, he had gathered on the advice of the wise elder at the edge of the village, he had gathered a couple of um, wedges, you know, which you used along with your axe to chop trees. And um, he had these wedges, and what he did was, without the knowledge of, of these supernatural fat old men, he put rocks into the wood so that when they went to chop with their axes and wedges, their wedges broke because they hit against the rocks. And the fat old man said, oh no, our wedges are broken. And the young man said, oh, I have a couple of wedges here, as he emerged from where he had been. I will give them to you. And, and they were grateful. And they said, you are near to the house of your wife. As a matter of fact, it is right nearby. And they showed him the way. And he, and he went that way. And he came to the house of his father-in-law, the father of the geese. And inside was his wife, where she had gone after she left his world. And they had a joyful reunion. But isn't it so often true that in myths, they're sparely told. Their very vagueness and their very um, tininess of, of what is given to our memories sometimes strikes us in such a way that we build a world in whatever way we do as human beings, and that becomes the mythical world that we come to understand. Anyway, the story tells us, Gondal tells us, that they dwelt together happily, and now he was among the goose people, whereas she, a goose, had once been among the human people, now he, a human, was now among the goose people, and they dwelled, dwelt together happily, and what they gathered he gathered, which seems to indicate that what they ate, he ate, or what they valued, he valued. It is open-ended in how we are to understand that with our emotional imaginations. But he must have gotten homesick. The story says, after a time, we don't know what time, this is after all kind of a timeless realm, but 
He desired to go home. He did not want to live in her world anymore. And his father-in-law, a goose, was responsible. And he said, okay, human, you want to go home? How will you get home? This is the world above. Who will help the human return to his own world? And the um, loon, that shy bird known as the loon, the loon came and offered her services. The loon said, uh, I can bring him down to his own world. And, and the other uh, goose people and the father-in-law, they asked, how will you do so? And the loon said, well, here's how I will do it. I will carry him under my tail and I will plummet off the edge of this world. I will plummet down to the water near his village and I will dive into the water and I will surface near his, his village and he will be brought to home in that way. And you know what all the goose people said and the father-in-law said? They said, no, no, you, you are too weak. You are too dense. You are too, uh, or he is too dense. He is too heavy for you. It, it cannot be done. Um, who else would like to try? And the grebe offered its services. And the grebe said, I, I, will, I will do it. I am stronger than the loon. Uh, how will you do it, O grebe? I will do it in the same way that the loon does it, carrying him near my tail, plummeting into the water and surfacing near his village. But they said, no, no, you are too weak. You cannot do this. And then Raven offered his services. And Raven, ooh, we could do a whole other section on Raven because Raven as a myth figure is, is, is enormous in Haida mythology. But in this case, Raven is pretty straightforward. Raven says, I will do it. I will carry him down to his world. How will he do it, oh Raven? I'll do it in this way. I'll put him under my wing. And then I will step off the edge of the upper world and I will go down, down, down. And I know he's heavy and I can carry him only so far. But hey, when I start to plummet and fall, he will plummet and fall with me. And whether I am flying, descending, or simply falling and descending, he will be with me when I bring him down to his own world. And they said, ah, Raven is strong enough to do this. So let Raven do this. And so that is how the human being was carried beneath the raven's wing and carried off the edge of the upper world all the way down to the human world once more. Raven was going down. Raven was able to fly sometimes. And when Raven was too tired, he would kind of fold his wings with the human being under his wing and would just fall. And eventually they got close, close, close to the, to the shore to the place where the water and the land meet of the human world. And the raven was just about to touch the surface of the land or the water when the raven said, okay, I've carried this burden long enough. Oh, that was a heavy load. I will release it now. And he opened up his wing and the human being fell from beneath the raven's wing and landed on a rock. And the story tells us stark and yet precise and enigmatically he landed upon the rock, and he uttered the cry of the seagull. He had become a seagull, and now the human being was a seagull on a rock crying out. And there the story ends. Look at what it leaves us with. Well, no, let the story end with the cry of the seagull. And what can you ask yourself about that? Yeah. Well, you can think about it a long time, and I... I, I, I I, I do this. I think about it a lot. <laughs> it seems to me, you know, the cry of the seagull. Now, when I see seagulls being a coastal person, I see them frequently enough. Those garbage eaters circling and spiraling, majestic with their uh, corsair-type wings. Um, what do they call those? Gull wings? And their beautiful, ah, cry, ah, ah. You know, and, and well, when I see seagulls now, I am... Um, I have an idea that perhaps um, in certain ways we're not so different. I don't know. It, does that make the myth by didactic? Uh, I don't know if it does or not. But anyway, but, and so, but that is the story. That is that, um, that is that world. Mythology, the theory of mythology is that 
we are living in, what were we calling it? A world. And the world is full of these potent entities and these disordered and charged um, relationships of power and obligation and morality. And the terms of the, of the myth are not equations or formulas or um, classifications, but no, are the terms of the myth are happenings, and, and, and they are what is related. And this is how uh, the world is formed in which our minds you know, can come to understand it. And so it is, it is this, it is this way. And Gondol, Gondol has brought it to us through Moody, through Swanton, through Snyder, through all these different mediums, through these interfaces and dwelling places between the unsayable and the unknowable, which is the living word, alive in sight only for a second. And the birds of thought believe the birds of thought, even as they fly from realm to realm and from place to place, doing the things that they do. Well, okay, so there's something more, though, that we need to do when we consider these interstices and these, and these coastal worlds and see how the time does, chronological time, that is. But we have been excursioning into a different kind of a sense of time, and I hope that we've touched upon it or given us something to nourish in our hearts and in our minds and in our memories. But let's just, let's just do one more thing. I want to read another poem from Gary Snyder, a poem that I'm really fond of, one of the most lovely didactic poems that, that um, seem to mean so much to me. Um, and this is what it is here, and I'll read this. Um, this is called, uh, by Gary Snyder, Ascesis Praxis Theoria of the Wild. This is the title, Ascesis Praxis and Theoria of the Wild. So let me just say, Ascesis, first of all. These are three Greek words, okay? This is, this is the, 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 the poet with such a Buddhist reputation, but let's look at these Greek Western words that he is using, and let's see the world that is being created here. Ascesis. What does Ascesis mean? Ascesis is, it means it's the source of our words like knowledge etymologically is related to the word science. It is related to the word discernment. It is related to the word discipline. It is related to the word disciple. It, uh, related to science, knowledge, discipline, disciple, ascesis. It is also, interestingly enough, related to the word anxiety. What it has to deal with or what it touches on in the constellation of meanings, in this poetics of meaning, it is um, strictures, restrictions, disciplines, processes, possibilities culled out of endless possibilities and limitations of possibility, passages, in other words, through which we go as a way, ascesis, okay? Praxis, what is praxis? Well, praxis is practice, application. Hmm? Literature is the praxis of mythology, you might say, generally spe speaking. Engineering is the praxis of science, you might say. Praxis, how something is made practical. Praxis, you see? Axis, praxis, and then, of course, theoria. Now, I've used the word a little bit, I think, from the very beginning of this, of this, of this talk. Theoria, well, theory, okay. Um... You know, explanation doesn't quite reach it, but um, perceptual offering of, of meaning, I don't know, theory, theory. In the previous talk, we talked about Apollo learning from the three I, the three sisters, about divination, a gift that Apollo gave to Hermes as a gift, you know, theory. Well, but the poem then goes on. It's a simple and yet deep poem. Anyway, the title is Ascesis Praxis Theory of the Wild by Gary Snyder, and this is how it goes. The shining way of the wild. The shining way of the wild, its theoria is. The shining way of the wild, its theoria is that the world 
is unrelenting, brief, and often painful. And it's ascesis, cold, hunger, stupid mistakes, bitterness, delusions, loneliness, hard nights and days are unavoidable. To find the praxis is to hang in, work it out, watch for the moment, coiled in gazing, the shining way of the wild. Let me read it all together once more. The shining way of the wild, its theoria is that the world is unrelenting, brief and often painful, and its ascesis, cold, hunger, stupid mistakes, bitterness, delusions, loneliness, hard nights and days, are unavoidable. To find the praxis is to hang in, work it out, watch for the moment, coiled and gazing, the shining way of the wild. So many ways you could talk about this, right? Ah, well, the shining way of the wild is that which is in our ordered minds and our ordered imaginations. There is, what is it now? That dwelling place, that interface, the living word. Could it be that the living word is the opening of the wild into our consciousness? I mean, the poet speaks of it there as coiled, like what? Verse means to turn. Snakes coil. Uh, universes is, universe is one turning. So could it be something like that, a manifestation of the universe amidst the language that is our inheritance, which are, we are trying to disentangle to come to a, a, a real and deep understanding of the world through the study of mythology. We as coastal peoples, and that is what we are as human beings. Anyway, we live on the edge of many, many worlds. And the language forms and the artistic forms are there for us to learn how to see into and see through so that sometime in some fortunate circumstances, we can all in our one mind see through the same eyes at the same time. And that would be doing it well. And isn't that what we're endeavoring to do? So in the interest of, of doing it well, you know, I offer the thoughts that, that have been related here now to you. And um, I thank you for your hero heroic listening. And um, let us continue on our human journey in this world and come to understand the deep truths that are always there. Okay, so long for now.